this is NDA. It's a it's a show where normally I like argue, you know, lightly debate with somebody yeah. from within the creator economy. Uh, but the the intent is that it's kind of like a the the sorts of things that are privileged conversations. You don't normally get to hear this stuff. Uh, because sure. most creator economy podcasts are people who already agree with each other sitting around talking about how great they are. Yeah. And I'm kind of exhausted with that. Like I like mm -hmm. a little bit of tension in the conversation. Today is different because uh, I think that it there's an opportunity to bring some attention within the creator economy to something that might not seem like it affects us, but I'm fairly convinced has huge impact for us. The, uh, the writer's strike. So yeah. – uh, my guest is John August. Hi, John. Hello. Who, uh, for those who don't know you, give us like the the thirty second Wikipedia. I am mostly a screenwriter. I wrote movies you've probably seen. I wrote. Uh, I started first movie was Go. Then I did the two Charlie's Angels movies, uh, Big Fish, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Uh, most recent movie was Aladdin. Uh, I've done some TV as well. I host a podcast called Script Notes. Uh, which is a podcast about screenwriting and things that are interesting to screenwriters. We were approaching episode 600 on that show that I host with Craig God, Mason. That's so many. So many episodes. We've been podcasting for forever. Uh, and I think relevant to this conversation, I'm a member of the negotiating committee for the Writers Guild of America West, uh, which was tasked with finding us a new contract with our employers and uh, has now brought us out on strike. I've seen people on Twitter, like creator people talking about, uh, this is a great opportunity for YouTubers. Mm -hmm. This, this only means there's going to be more people looking for things to watch. They'll come to us. And that seems kind of short-sighted to me. And so what I want to explore here with you is what, what something like this means to the larger creator community, not like sure. creator in terms of like digital media creator, but, um, People who like you're, you're as much a creator as as we are. Mm -hmm. Like you're yeah. out there. You're like the things you make show up in theaters. The things we make show up on uh, mobile phones mostly. But it's still like similar processes. And and the things I do, the things we do, the things you do, largely are still distributed in one form or another mm -hmm. by giant global media companies or technology yeah. companies. And so how they treat the people who make the things, it seems like that should be important to us. It absolutely should be. So it might be helpful to sort of go back on a little primer about why there is a Writers Guild of America and sort of what that history is. I, mean, yeah, I think please. people have a misunderstanding of, of, of what it is, what this group actually is. Um, so we are very fortunate in the United States that we have unions and we have unions that can protect creators. And one of those unions is the Writers Guild of America. It goes back you know, maybe 80 years, 90 years. Um, it was originally formed to, as a group of screenwriters, these are people writing for, for films, to uh, do things like, you know, uh, protect their credits, basically determine who got credit on a movie, to uh, talk about minimums for payment so that, that the least you could pay us for a screenplay or a day's work. Um, this was a time of labor activism overall in Hollywood, so it's when you first started to see uh, all the trades, you know, coming together. So you had the folks who shoot the films, you know, the different, the gaffers, the grips, the electricians, everybody sort of figuring out like what their day rate should be. This is a union town and this was, Writers Guild was one of the most important early creative unions. Over the years, as we you know, renegotiated our contract, we went on strike many, many times, we got things like residuals, which is the equivalent of royalties. Um, so if I write uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, um, the studio gets that for free once in, in the theaters. They get to show it in theaters. But then when it shows up in home video, when it shows up in DVDs, when it shows up on TVs, we get extra payments for those. And those payments are incredibly important for streaming out the peaks and valleys of, of our income. Uh, we got things like our health and our pension plans. We have uh, paid family leave, which is something we won in the, the uh, 2020 contract. So it's a way of all the writers coming together and being able to win for each other things we could not individually get for ourselves. So the Writers Guild sets minimums for things, and then we negotiate individual contracts for things above and beyond that. So, you know, minimum for a screenplay might be one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, but my agents, my lawyer, can uh, push to get me paid more than that for the draft of that screenplay, and that's really how it works. I mean, we're still, you know, a bunch of entrepreneurs, but we're a bunch of entrepreneurs working together to sort of. Uh, make things for ourselves and really make a living, make a career. 
And there's been talk over the years of YouTubers should unionize. And the trouble with that is that when it's user-generated content, uh, especially at this scale, getting enough people to join the union, like mm -hmm. who are you bargaining against? Is it the sponsors? Is it the platform? It gets it's trickier because yeah. it's it's already so distributed. So I think a lot of the benefits of of unionization might be lost on parts of this community because it's either much more difficult to get there or or potentially not even possible. But I do think that we um, within the creator economy on YouTube and, and in podcasting, despite the relationship differences between how we approach the platform and how you might approach um, like a, a movie studio. Uh, I think there are more similarities than than might be obvious at first glance. Yeah. Uh, how you get paid out, you're talking about residuals, that might not be obvious on our side because we don't really think in those terms. Like you put something on YouTube and it's just kind of on YouTube and you just get your AdSense money. Yeah. Uh, and if you want to repost it on TikTok, you can. You're sort of in charge of, in control of your own distribution. Yeah. But it's the same kind of, same. Uh, it's a similar set of rules where what we make for a piece of content, you know, uh, the the our percentage of the the cut of ads uh, through AdSense, who's setting that number and who gets to decide that number and how how are those things impacted by what we could get if we went to you know a different company and uh, so much of what we do is dependent on free market, I guess, um, but these numbers are set somewhere. These rates. So a couple of things here, and um, I, I want to get back to sort of the YouTube analogy because in some ways I think it actually ties more into a thing we did three years ago with our agents, which is a little bit closer to that because your creators are not working for YouTube. They're using YouTube. They're partnering with YouTube in order to do a thing versus uh, Writers in the Writers Guild of America. We are working for our employers. Our studios are paying us and we are working under contract with those people. And um, we made a fundamental decision to give up our copyright on the things that we write in order so we could be considered employees of these companies. So, uh, you know, we don't have, I don't have the ability to sort of take my movie Go and do whatever I want to do with it because I've given up those rights for, uh, in exchange for union protection. But what you talk about with, with the uh, creators and their relationship with YouTube is a little bit more analogous to our partnership with our agencies. And so um, most of the writers working in the Writers Guild have agents who are responsible for negotiating their above scale uh, pay. And agents are an important part of how, sort of how you get work, how you get your you know, career together. What we discovered though over the past you know, decade was that these agencies as they got bigger and bigger were doing more things that were um, helping them and not necessarily helping their clients, their writer clients, which I think may be a sort of analogous to what we yeah. see with these, you know, with YouTubes and TikToks and everything else, they're supposed to be kind of working for you. I'm working on your behalf. You're supposed to be working in partnership, and yet they, the relationship can actually become exploitative because you know, an individual person has no ability to push back against it. Uh, so what we did, this is three years ago, uh, we, into all the writers in the Writers Guild, fired our agents on the same day and negotiated with the agencies to say, okay, these are going to be the new terms under which you are allowed to represent us. And we specifically said, you can only, you know, you have a fiduciary responsibility to represent us first and not your own interests. And so you cannot be cutting sweetheart deals with different uh, studios. You cannot be producing content yourself. You cannot be uh, doing what's called packaging fees, where they, instead of charging us a commission, they were taking a kickback directly from the studios. We said these were not allowed. Uh, it was a really difficult campaign. It's hard to explain about that explanation wasn't very good, but to explain it to uh, our entire membership, to explain it to the town, to everybody else, to investors, uh, it took two years to get all the agencies to sign on to this agreement, but we ultimately wow. did. And we were the first union to sort of like push back against these sort of glowing, growing corporations. Um, so that was, a very, that was a very unusual campaign, uh, but it's probably a little bit more analogous to what your content creators might be facing. So what happened for those two years? People just... The writers had no representation? We had no, we had no representation. And that originally we were negotiating wow. against a group called the ATA, which was the Association of Talent Agencies. And they were representing the collective block of all the different talent agencies. And when it became clear that we couldn't make a deal with them as a block, individual agencies started peeling away and would negotiate separate deals with us. And so a company called Verve was one of the first agencies and other small agencies broke off. It finally got down to the big four, then the big three agencies. Then we were just 
down to two last ones. And so CAA and WME, which is B. William Morris, were the last agencies to sign. Um, and we had to figure out, we had to negotiate, we had to figure out how we were going to sunset out some of their business practices to, to move us to this new place where we're supposed to be. And it actually ties very well into the current writer's strike because what our leadership recognized is that all the gains we were making in our every three-year negotiation with the big studios, with the Warners and Disney's and the Netflixes, those gains were being sort of eaten away by the money that our own agencies were taking out of our pockets. Mm. And so we had to fix the agency problem before we could go in and uh, really address other systemic problems that were happening in the industry. Yeah, and in that scenario, like th there's so much sand moving underneath you. It's not just the agencies. It's not just the the media companies. It's also literally the the media world itself. Like streaming mm. suddenly becomes a thing. We somehow didn't see it coming as much as we should have with TV and film, even though music had just gone through the same thing a, a yeah. few years earlier. Uh, so all of these deals for all of these these uh, older projects, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, don't necessarily include how you get paid for that. Well, they do now because of the last strike that we had, which was in 2007. So in yeah. 2007, the Writers Guild recognized like, oh, the internet, it's a thing. And so back in that time, the most we had of our content on the internet was like, webisodes of the office and it, it, clearly that wasn't a profit center but we also felt like this is going to become a thing there's yeah. this stuff that's going to change here and so we went on strike insisting on jurisdiction over the internet so projects made for the internet would still be covered under our contract just right. like film and just like tv and so um, all the stuff that is made for that including like you know our movies that are then sold through itunes we had to come up with terms for how we're going to do that so all that stuff is called new media um, which is silly that it's still called New Media 15 years later. But um, the, the the reason why we have jurisdiction over streaming, over Netflix, over HBO Max and all these things is because of that 2007 strike, which we were out for 100 days. And we were able to finally negotiate a contract that made it clear that, okay, this material they're generating that, that is like film and television for the internet, it is covered by these terms. And uh, they weren't great at the start, but over the, you know, over the, every three years we could renegotiate the contract and push things back up so we could, you know, something closer to fair for the value that we create. Because it's important to remember, we have, yeah, we have 4,000 members, you know, sorry, we have 11,000 members now, but like those 4,000 hours of film and television that we make every year, um, all the money that they make is stuff that we, we created for them. Part of the absurdity over the the notion of a writer strike not on behalf of the writers but like letting the right letting it get to that point where the writers actually yeah. strike is uh you can't make anything if there's not a script yeah and what we're seeing if if any, anybody's paying attention to the news here is solidarity across the industry yeah. directors showrunners actors are going out and and getting in the picket line it's not as if this is long term a real winning play, at least from how I see it. And it seems like I saw um, the a tweet thread today about how like they keep drawing like the the line in the sand of we will not negotiate on this point, which just sells the idea that okay, that's really important to you. Great, we're going to force this too. Like long term, they're gonna have to come to terms and and set up a deal. But the things that are in focus right now. Uh, the, the big one, as I'm aware of it, is AI. I would say AI is an important issue, but I wouldn't say it's the most important issue. So okay. I would say, here's an analogy I'm, I'm, I'm trying out here, so we'll, we'll give it a, a test run on, on this podcast. Love it. So most of what uh, writers are facing right now is really a result of the shift to streaming. And so writers are facing in episodic the rise of what's called a mini room, which is where mm -hmm. you are getting together a group of writers, uh, putting them together for maybe 10 weeks, they're writing 10 episodes, creating and writing 10 episodes of that show, writing the scripts. Those writers are sent away. Sometimes months later, you start production and then you go through post production. None of those writers are still involved, and the showrunner is left by him or herself to produce all of this television. It's a crisis on so many levels. First off, the writer's pay is being pushed down by low rates on the mini room, but also the limited amount of time they're working. So it's the, the rate times the number of weeks. These writers are not making enough to make a living in Los Angeles. Right. Um, that showrunner is stressed out as hell because there's no writers around to help them make the show that they're supposed to be making. And those writers who were in that original mini room, they get no experience actually making the show. And so when it comes their time to 
create their own show, they're not going to be able to do it. It's like a long term crisis going to be happening to ah. The so industry. there's no training grounds. There's no training because classically, back in the day when we would do 22 episodes of TV for a season you would be writing while you were actually in production. So writers would be going to set all the time, they'd be going to post all the time, they would just learn how to do the whole job. And there was a sense of a ladder. You'd start as a staff writer, you'd move up to story editor, executive story editor, then a co-producer, you, 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 all those names you see you know, before in the opening credits, those are sort of the job titles as you're moving up the ladder to all the way up to executive producer and then showrunner. You were learning how to do those jobs because you were involved in production. That's not happening now. So... That's the thing which is simultaneously about compensation, about these writers not being paid enough for their time and the value they're creating, but also working conditions. They're just not going to be able to maintain or establish a career because of structural problems, like a system that they created, the streamers really created, that we have to fix. I got caught up on Barry last night, mm -hmm. watched the, yeah. the most recent episode, and I was thinking to myself, how many episodes are in a season? And I look, and we're, we're on the final season, and every season so far, and presumably this season, eight episodes. And it's like, yeah. 32? That's like 1.2 seasons of Star Trek The Next Generation yeah. for an entire run of a show. Mm -hmm. That's kind of nuts Yeah, that that's even possible. There are some really good things about the short seasons. You can do more adventurous stuff because you're not so constrained to you know, your production schedule and your sets and all this stuff. You can do some really interesting things, you know, because you can do these short seasons, but it is a crisis on a lot of levels. And so if we're going to have short seasons, we can't dictate sort of how long a season should be. We mm -hmm. can, what we can dictate is how many writers you need to employ during that writing process, during production and during post to make sure that um, you actually have the ability to make a good show in a safe way, in a way that is sustainable for everybody involved. And so that's one of the things we're fighting for. On, on the episodic front. And I, I'm certainly not challenging the notion, but I yeah. want to make sure I have my head around it because a lot of a lot of what I want the audience to get from this conversation is an understanding of uh, the similarities and differences between mm -hmm. these two worlds to help oh, yeah. bridge that gap. But so much of what we do, it's like uh, like auteur YouTuber, like mm -hmm. auteur oh, yeah. video creator, auteur yeah. video essayist or, or whatever. So to say that there needs to be a certain number of writers in the room mm -hmm. Uh, if if somebody wanted to just go make a show by themselves, why would you need more people in the room? Why why require more people in the room? Well, the minimum number of, of writers on a project would be zero. And uh, <laughs> I think we, we, it's, it's always funny because the studios are always studios have been trying to throw back at us, like like oh we don't want to dictate what a showrunner's process would be or how many writers they need to employ. But bullshit, they're always telling writers they can't they can't get staff their staff bigger. It's only when the staff wants to be one person that they're okay with, like, with setting a staff size on things. Um, mm -hmm. It goes back to what we're talking about. It's like, we want to be able to make uh, really amazing television and we know how to do this after doing it for 50 years. Uh, we know how important it is to be able to have a writer's room. And so uh, writer's rooms are sort of fundamental. It's they're how we make television, but it's also how we make television writers. And if we don't uh, protect that writer's room idea, they're not going to be television writers. We also have oh. really good examples from animation, especially kids' animation. What's happened in that market, which the Writers Guild doesn't control all of that market, is they will have a showrunner, and that showrunner can hire freelance writers to just do a script, um, but that they don't have a staff. They don't have people around to actually oversee the writing, to do the writing. And so it's just a bunch of subcontractors, and uh, it's a crisis in, in children's television a children's animation is deeply broken because of that. Those people don't have weekly employment. They're just hired to write a script for $10,000. And it's, there's no way to actually make a living at that. Is that because on a kid's show, the presumption is that you don't need a level of continuity? You can kind of just crank them out and they can each be their own thing? What? I think it's because they could get away with it, honestly. Because there uh. used to be staffs, there used to be TV staffs and kids' animation. And because the, it was not Writers Guild covered, uh, they got away without doing it. And they were always looking for ways to pinch a penny. And in pinching a penny, they they broke things. They broke things kind of fundamentally. D is that something that the audience would notice? Here's the reason why I think they don't notice as much as they should is because uh, those showrunners are, they're authors and they're doing everything they possibly can do to make those shows as good as they, they fucking possibly can be. And the studio is relying on our pride of authorship to make 
uh, to make up for their their bad financial decisions. Right. Um, so those those writers, their showrunners should have more support. They should have more people uh, helping them out, uh, but they don't, and they're doing the best they can. And it's uh, a reason for burnout for uh, this you know sort of real fundamental you know bad choices uh, in, with these shows. I was just speculating that maybe it's because kids are less likely to notice. It's easier mm-hmm. to let that get that far. Not to yeah. say anything bad about children, but level of sophistication of viewership, I guess. Uh, and I guess a similar thing sort of happens on YouTube. Like the, I think the number one video on YouTube is still, I think, Baby Shark. Oh, sure. Baby Shark or, or kids unwrapping stuff. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, something that's both true of YouTube and of a lot of television of episodic content is that, yeah, we have, there's some amazing stuff and there's just a, a, a shit ton of crap. And, uh, the fact there's a lot of shit, there's a shit ton of crap it doesn't mean that, that we should aspire to make it easier to make shit ton of crap. I think we all want to make good stuff. And uh, the worry is that these systems are being enacted that's going to make it almost impossible to make the really good stuff. And we'll, you'll only be able to aim for like the crap. I want to go back to something you said a minute ago, which I had not considered at all, which is a writer's room is how you get new showrunners. Mm-hmm. Uh I had never considered that. In our yeah. world, you just sort of show up and start doing stuff. And if you're, uh, if you've got latent talent and you're telegenic and uh, lucky, you find your way there. And Dave, how much? How much? How much do these shows cost? How much? Uh, you got some latent talent. How much money is being spent there? Uh, on a YouTube show? Yeah. Like from the like the average like YouTuber just getting started, probably yeah. nothing. Yeah. And how many people are being employed? Nobody. Exactly. And so the and so th- the ramp up yeah. from zero, it like it almost om- it literally like you can. I have a, a an iPhone mm-hmm. here that has a pretty good microphone, a pretty good camera, and I can edit video on it. And I can yeah, load up great. now, as of today, Final Cut Pro on my iPad, so, and I can so edit it there. I don't even need a computer anymore. Nope. So yeah, anybody can do this. Yeah. So the way we think about how hard it is to make something is so fundamentally different. It is, and so let's say you have a you know similarly talented like you know. A person with a lot of potential who is going into sort of doing a YouTube thing versus going into do uh, a series, do a, a Game of Thronesy kind of series. Mm. Uh, the level of of expertise required is so different because it's the stakes are just so much higher. So I will use myself as an example. So I had my first movie go. It hadn't come out yet, but people knew it was going to be a good movie. People loved the script. I was a very hot writer at that point, and I met with the WB network, and they said, we'd love to do a show with you. I'm like, sure, I'll do a show. I really want to do a show about um, college grads, like, sort of like that first couple of years after college where you're just like, figuring stuff out. I really want to set it in Washington, D.C. I want to do some research on like legislative consultants and sort of like how all that sort of fits together. So like a post-Felicity show. And they're like, that's great. Make, the, make us that show. And they partnered me up with Dick Wolf, who is the, you know, the titan who did Law & Order and all Law these and order. shows. Yeah. And uh, no one thinking like, does that sound like a Dick Wolf show? No, it doesn't sound like it at all. That was a that was a real problem. And so suddenly, I so I wrote this script. And I'm like, this script is great. Go make this. Go make this show. Um, suddenly, I was put in charge of an enterprise that had hundreds of employees, uh, other writers, uh, sets in Toronto and in Washington D.C., a post room happening in Los Angeles. I was 28 years old. And had no experience and no training. Wow. Um, it should be to no one's surprise that I completely flamed out. I got fired after three episodes and the show was a disaster. Um, that's the difference we're talking about here is that like the stakes were so much higher. And thank God, like no one died. There weren't like sexual harassment lawsuits. There's like nothing else bad happened. But I was not ready and prepared to be running that show because I had no experience and no training. And that's training I would have gotten if I'd worked on another show. If I'd sort of come up those up the ladder and learned how to do these things, yeah. Um, so it, it was a bad experience for me. It was a bad experience for the studio. Uh, it's just a bad idea to have given me that responsibility. Yeah, and that's what's going to be happening more and more and more as you know, really talented writers get their shows and have no experience how to make them. And this is where so the differences there are super interesting, but also the similarities where. Uh, it is easier to like you know launch a YouTube channel, post a video. It is that doesn't guarantee success. Like no. infinite distribution, infinite audience, 
you know, uh, anybody, the algorithm thinking that anyone will give a shit about the video you made. There's no guarantees. Yeah. Uh, I think the barrier to entry is obviously much lower, especially around cost. But to to hit like a level of, uh, in the same way that I think if you, like anybody could buy a computer and a copy of Highland and write a screenplay, that yeah. doesn't mean that anyone's going to see it or care. Anybody could get a camera and start uh, making a movie. doesn't mean that anyone's going to care. When you hit a point in in this world over here where anyone's paying attention, there's this big gap between uh, you're starting to, to make some waves, you're starting mm -hmm. to build an audience and really making it. And I think that the analogy there would be like getting your first writing gig versus being showrunner. And that that delta in the YouTube world tends to be building up a community of other people who have done this before, bringing in that expertise, talking to the other creators. And so functionally, it's a little bit different. You're not necessarily collaborating on a single creative project, but you sort of collaborate as a community and learn from one another. And most of what we do isn't like scripted fiction stuff anyway, so it, it dissolves a little bit. Yeah. But that same thing of you help somebody out with their videos or you you uh, start, start out, it's very common actually to see uh, creators who are their day job is helping another big name creator edit their videos yeah. or somebody doing research work. And I think this might be a, a, a similarity that, that is easily missed, at least was for me that the, the same sort of, um, apprenticeship journeyman sort of process of, of there's not a school necessarily that you can mm -hmm. go to, to become YouTuber. Uh, I, I guess that's the, that probably applies for being a showrunner on a popular television show. You have to get that experience somewhere. Yeah. And so the WGA actually has, you know, a showrunner's training program. So, you know, they recruit, really? basically, you can apply to be in it. So if you're already a WGA member and, like, you are about to run a show, you go through this sort of intensive boot camp, you know, showrunner's training program, great. And you, they, you'll get some guidance from other showrunners about how to do it. But that's assuming that you actually already have experience of like how a show works. I was running a TV show and never actually mm. been on a TV show, and that was the crisis here. So your your comparison to, you know, sort of how YouTubers figure it out, you can also it's, and I don't want to sort of minimize this, but you can sort of see how it's done. I mean, you can sort of watch a video, you can watch mm. some videos, and sort of see like, okay, I get what the the sense is and what the structure is. I get how all this works. It's not quite like being able to like. You go to a web page and like look at the HTML to figure out sort of how it works, but you get a sense of like yeah. of how this all goes in terms of how you're putting it together. The mechanics of how you fine tune stuff, how you market to an audience, like that's all sort of special sauce. But the actual getting the the video together to to put together, you can sort of figure it out, and that's. Um, and there's an entire cottage industry of people d telling you how to do that and plenty of shows, uh, video and otherwise, of people telling you, here's how I do this thing, where there's yeah. not necessarily that that same sort of thing. And again, the stakes are so low. The stakes are, you know, it's, the stakes are your time versus, you know, millions of dollars. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's certainly at the higher end, like a Mr. Beast video costs millions of, of course, dollars. And if that, if that fails, but again, we're talking like that is the closest thing we have to a blockbuster TV show. Yeah. And the budget on that is probably seven digits. Yeah. Which is great. But like the first Mr. Beast video didn't have to cost millions of dollars. Yeah, I mean, no. again, you're, you're going to ramp up to that. And, uh, and he learned how to be the showrunner of that specific universe of what he creates an exception that kind of proves the rule. He's such an outlier that yeah. despite how hard anyone is trying to be Mr. Beast, you kind of get one of those or maybe two mm -hmm. or three. And then uh, the you hit a point of diminishing returns on that exact strategy. And you also hit a point of diminishing returns on that just sort of like um, somebody who shows up and is sort of innately tuned for this world and can navigate it um, there's like that savant nature of like you show up and you just kind of like have an intuition and an aptitude mm -hmm. and you're perfectly like almost bioengineered to do yeah. this job. And I think that's what, what Jimmy is for, for YouTube. Uh, for the people out there who are trying really hard to be good at this, uh, there's plenty of resources on uh, how to get started with making a video. And there is a sort of a conveyor belt. There's a system out mm -hmm. there, the, the yeah. YouTube algorithm that is constantly looking for things that YouTube's audience would want to watch. Yeah. And if you get plucked out and and put in front of somebody, your show could blow up, your YouTube channel could blow up. And while there are certainly shows at the higher end of this where lots of money is being spent on production, at the lower end, production is zero. 
Yeah, and, and so I agree Mr. Beast is sort of an outlier, but if you look at you know the Thomas Frank videos or any of the explainer videos, like you sort of see how that works. You sort of mm-hmm. see what the, the the preparation that goes into it, you see sort of how it's cut together. There's a style, there's a way to do this. And uh, you know, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's really understandable to sort of how you get to that place. And, and so much of it is personality you know, driven. Yeah, exactly. And you know, in our episodic land, those are probably the procedurals. Like there's ways that there's, you know, the law and orders, the Chicago fires, those are, you know, procedurals. And that's not a pejorative term. It's just like there's a structure to it. You know what to expect when you're going into one of those those things. And those are part of the sort of key blocks of programming there. The difference is that our, you know, YouTube explainer videos, our procedurals, costs, you know, ten million dollars a piece and have giant crews and safety concerns yeah. and lots of other things. And, and there's so much more of a management function for those than um, would be in any YouTube universe. Whereas a Thomas Frank video is mm-hmm. him sitting down in his basement where he just turns on the lights, turns on the cameras. Hell, I'm sitting in a room right now where I've got lights on, I've got a camera. Uh, we've got uh, Eric, the producer, on the the call with us and yeah. Mike's out in the other room in case anything explodes. But this, the cost of making this is not enormous. And I, I, got, I got no lights. I got some sunlight <laughs> happening here. That's all I got. So, But the other big difference here is that in scripted narrative fiction, episodic or serialized content land, um, those are things that have to be plotted out and written. Yeah. Like you're, you're planning a season of television or you're planning the, the story arc of a movie with multiple characters who need to start at A and end at B and here's mm-hmm. why, or whatever. And, and here's why. In our world, there's like story arc considerations if you're mm-hmm. good at writing a video, but there's not necessarily like, it's not the same sort of writing. It's yeah. not fiction. And when I see people tweeting about uh, AI is coming and these writers just don't know how to uh, handle new technology and that's on them, we're gonna be using it out here in YouTube world making a fortune, mm-hmm. that sort of seems to miss the point. What you're describing is, Using AI tools to do something kind of new and different and and unexpected, mm-hmm. and I think that kind of disruption is going to happen. And I don't think we can anticipate sort of what it's going to be. But the idea sure. that these AI tools are these generative AI tools are going to create something that is just like fascinating and uh, and uh, addictive in a general sense and um, just unique uh, is absolutely going to happen. I don't think we can anticipate kind of what that's going to look like, but it's going to pull attention away from other media, including existing YouTube videos and Game of Thrones and all the other stuff that's out there because people only have 24 hours a day and there could be some new form of entertainment that comes out of this that we just can't even anticipate. Um, that is going to be impact you know, writers, but it's really going to impact the studio. It's going to impact our employers. So there's a degree to which the companies we're negotiating against have to be really concerned about AI, uh, not as a tool that they can use, but as something that could replace them. And right. uh, that's sort of a background on, on all this sort of discussion is that uh, something brand new could come down the pike that is going to be so disruptive that you know people aren't going to see the next you know Marvel movie because there's something more appealing to spend their time on. Wasn't it? I think uh, Joe Russo had just said a thing about like being able to sit down and 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 tell the the AI that you want to watch a movie with an avatar mm-hmm. based on you, starring you, and uh, it was like. Anne Hathaway or something yeah. and just sit back and watch that play out. And that is, well, one, a little bit dystopian, mm-hmm. two, probably inevitable. Yeah, but I, I think I would only push back on the sense like you're still, he's still framing it as a movie starring Anne Hathaway and like I don't right. think it's going to be that. It's going to be an experience. It's going to be something, you know, interactive or some, you know, ex, it's just going to be an experience that it's not going to be a movie. I think it's going to be something different. It's, it's not going to have our, our normal boundaries of like this is a thing I'm watching on a screen. It's going to be something different. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, and this is where like the the augmented reality, um, mm. virtual reality stuff, uh, like that that is going to happen. Some version of that is going to happen. Yeah. Probably not what Zuckerberg thinks it's going to be. Probably not what the studios think it's going to be. It's going to be weird and awkward at first. Like so many of – like any new medium is weird and awkward yeah. at first. I think YouTube is still in its weird and awkward phase. But the, the way that the – the people who make the things. There's an element of truth, I think, in the the grumpy uh, YouTuber tweets. I 
I was tempted to read stuff, but I don't want to read it anything verbatim because I don't want people getting looked up or whatever. Yeah. Um, but it, it's a sentiment I'm seeing of why are they complaining? Yeah. And what interests me is bridging the gap and understanding. Like the empathy matters, uh, mm-hmm. especially if you're a video essayist making video essays about Marvel movies. You should kind of care about this <laughs> yeah. because if we if we run out of Marvel movies, what the fuck are you going to talk about? Yeah. Uh, But also I think that fundamentally for me, it comes down to the rules that are established between uh, the, the, the creative professionals working at the highest levels, people who are writing these Marvel movies, people who are writing our favorite TV shows, all of the things that we can't stop talking about all day, every day, how they are treated by structural systems run Mm -hmm. by global mega corporations. Uh, that is going to affect how we are treated by those global mega corporations. If there are no rules governing how much of your job can be replaced by artificial intelligence, then there's no rules governing how much of a YouTuber could be replaced. Like if Google can just replace human beings entirely and not have to split the AdSense cost, what's stopping them from generating fake videos that look perfectly real and slipping those in and feeding those out through the algorithm to the audience. If the audience doesn't notice and nobody complains, we're just sort of slowly replaced by fake YouTubers. Is that a good thing? Or should there be rules that stop that from happening? Right now, there's no conceivable way for all these YouTubers to get together to push back and and establish some rules. And so they could wait for the government, you know, either European government or the United States government to somehow step in and sort of create those rules. That's not going to happen. Um, and likewise, the WJ could wait until uh, the, the U.S. government comes in and says, like, oh, these are the, going to be the rules to protect writers on these things. That's not going to happen. And we have a mm-hmm. chance every three years in our contract to say, like, oh, no, these are the, the things that we need to see happen or else we're not going to keep working for you guys. And uh, we were just kind of fortunate that this issue came on our radar at a time when we were about to negotiate our contract to sort of come up and say, like, okay, for this contract, it's important that we establish these two things. And so the WJ proposals on AI, just so to be clear, because we're sort of talking around it, is that material generated by AI um, is not considered literary material or source material for the purposes of the contract, which is a very legalese and specific way of getting into it. But it's basically saying that stuff that it has no writer, you know, the material generated by AI has no writer per se, uh, means that it cannot be considered literary material, which is like screenplays, uh, uh, treatments, outlines, the stuff that we're paid under our contract to write, nor can it be source material like a Stephen King book or a short story. And those two things are important because it protects both the the generative aspect of what AI is doing, like it's, it's creating things that are uh, going to be the, the, the root material of, of other stuff that we're, we're going to be hired to rewrite a crappy AI script, and also protects our work from becoming the source material um, that's feeding into the algorithm that they can't just take all the scripts that Nora Ephron has ever written and say like, okay, write me a new Nora Ephron romantic comedy, and we'll say it's a Nora Ephron comedy. Like it's protecting us on those two fronts. Interesting. It's a little. It, it sounds a little in the weeds, but it's a it's it's a single proposal that very directly addresses the threat that we're facing as folks who write stuff for these companies. Here's where I come back to. It's so like, um, let's say you're writing a movie about. Um, one battle in the Civil War. And so you you may have tracked out some book and you say, like, oh, I'm going to base my, my Civil War movie on this great accounting of this of the Civil War from th- this thing. Great. You'd say that that book, that was source material because it's very specific to that. But you wouldn't say, like, I'm basing it on this Wikipedia article. Uh, you'd never see a movie that's like, you know, based on a Wikipedia article by <laughs> no one because Wikipedia has no author. It has no sort of source. So we're saying, like, we can imagine stuff generated by AI um, that is kind of like the same thing as a Wikipedia article. It's just it's it's research. Sure, it was there, but it's not the foundational text on which future things are adapted. Right. And that's important for us because our rates for doing an original thing versus an adaptation can be different. Um, we have whole credit systems that are are based on figuring out who is the the real author of a piece. Our residuals are based on that. Our you know, our pride of authorship is based on that. And so it's important that we figure out and sort of define right now that stuff that is generated by one of these large language models uh, is does not count in the same way that something written by a human being is counted. And is that important because 
you I'm I'm just going to invent a scenario yeah. here. Please. If if a if a studio generates a script with ChatGPT and then says, "Here, yeah. rewrite this to be good." Uh you own less of it than had you in in yeah. a world where mm -hmm. that is considered yeah. source material. You own less of it uh even though you had to go in and do basically all of the work. Exactly. So uh, they could pay. They would be allowed to pay you a lower rate for that. Um, it's almost like you know how you know Midjourney and the other AI art tools uh, can make things that are really beautiful, but like people have too many fingers. Um, it'd <laughs> yeah, be like yeah. if you're an artist whose whole job was just to go through <laughs> and like take care of all the deformed hands in Midjourney uh, things. Like right. that's not. They're going to pay you less for that than for for making the whole thing. Yeah, because and, uh, you you would be fixing the art, or you'd have to go out and take new pictures and try to like lighting match. There's no way that you could. Uh, I mean, maybe you go with a pencil or something. It, 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 at what point are you editing versus creating? It's consistent with the studio's goal of 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 devaluing the writers and pushing our our wages lower and lower and lower by keeping us employed for less time and for paying us lower rates for the work that we're trying to do. Um, so that's, you know, it's, is this going to be a crisis in 2023? Not likely, but it feels like before our next contract in 2026, that could be a real giant issue. And we want to make sure we're taking care of it now. So it's less about the art, the, the artistic question of, mm -hmm. uh, if, if mid journey creates an image and then you go in and edit that image, are you the originating artist less about that and more about is this a is that loophole now a tool that a studio can use to take a treatment, turn it into a script, and now you own less? I think both are important. So I, I don't want to sort of discount the moral and philosophical aspect there. Um, but the practical issue is that it, it's consistent with the things that studios have always tried to do, which is to find ways to pinch pennies and and pay writers less money. But circling back to like the the moral and and philosophical issues there, one of the things that the industry deserves some credit for is that over the last decade. They have made significant progress in trying to increase diversity and inclusion in writers' rooms and among writers um, to tell more authentic stories um, by people who are parts of communities that are underrepresented um, in, in, on screen and in sort of in the, the conversation. And so you see the number of writers employed who are you know members of uh, of ethnic minorities or you know LGBTQ plus uh, number of women. That those numbers have increased dramatically over the last ten years, and that's a you know a goal of just telling more authentic stories. There is nothing less authentic than a story that is being generated by a computer algorithm that's not even a human being. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's directly diametrically opposed to the progress we've been trying to make over the last ten years. Even was it um, in Rogue One trying to recreate Princess Leia at the end? Like, it, yeah. uh, we're still in the uncanny valley, right? Yeah, uh, and then but but it got better, you it, know. It it did get better, and we can deep fake, and we can de-age, and there's all these tools. It will get better. So even if this isn't a practical concern today, it is worth yeah. addressing now, so that it's not like you don't want to you don't want to be trying to solve the problem when the ship has already sailed. That's the wor real worry, and that if we uh, kick the can to 2026 when this comes up next time, that'll be uh, the issue. And so in our negotiations to cut to the uh, to the punchline. We insisted on these, these, this one proposal, our AI proposal, which is literary material, source material. And they came back to us to say, like, we'll agree to a once a year meeting to discuss new technology. Yeah, I saw that. And uh, that's not going to be a, that's not a solution. So, uh, uh, so this is not the reason we're out on strike, but it's, it, I think it was consistent with the other things that were problems um, that, which the studios were not addressing our core fundamental issues of compensation and structural issues that have to change in order for writing to be a career. Not to play devil's advocate, but trying yeah. to think through this. I'm I'm in a, I don't know what my job maps to in that world, but like mm -hmm. running a streaming video service, like yeah. I can imagine like what must that be like for whoever is in charge of HBO Max now um, or Max, whatever the fuck they're calling it. Yeah. Uh, so the questions of of like, who is your first responsibility to the the artists, uh, the people who make the things, the creators, is your responsibility to the audience, uh, the people who are paying the money in, 
and what are the unforeseeable consequences of a decision that are made today? So just putting on the empathy hat more than the, mm -hmm. the devil's advocate hat, do you think that they're arguing from a place of, of – I don't want to put words in your mouth, but like uh, in the direction of greed or bad faith, or do you think that this is they're trying to hedge their bets in the, in the same way that, that the writers are trying to hedge their bets to make sure that they don't end up in a contract where there's unforeseen consequences? I don't have to even speculate because they said it in the room. They said like, you know, they said, uh, we want to keep our options open in case we need to, we decide we want to use, implement these tools later on. So um, they, they, they don't want to, they don't want to come down any place on AI in case they want to keep their, you know, they decide that they want to use it later on. But the larger framing of what you're talking about there is the question of who are they responsible to? Uh, they would say they're shareholders. Uh, mm, yeah. And they're making a lot of, uh, of, I think, really frustrating short term decisions based on shareholder value and trying to pump up stock prices. They're always looking at not just at profitability, but like, Increasing their profitability time after time, which is why they're doing layoffs and they're you know disc discarding entirely produced movies for tax write-offs. They're doing all these things to pump up the value, which is not actually improving um, the long-term survivability of their corporations. Uh, there was a time, you know, in the fifties and sixties when these companies had values that were beyond just the immediate share share price. They were really looking at sort of their employees and everyone who's working for them, they're looking at the audience. They, were, they had a sense of responsibility beyond that. And I think it's just uh, probably starting in the 80s and into the 90s that the shareholder value trumping everything else became part of the issue. It's also worth noting that this used to be a company town where there were like six companies and you sort of know their names. It was like Warner's, Paramount, uh, Columbia Pictures. And you knew who the person was who was in charge because they were actually responsible for making movies and TV themselves. And the companies we're negotiating now are these giant multinational behemoths who are, you know, you know Disney is a, a, a zillion different companies. Uh, Amazon is barely a, you know, a, a, a producer of a streaming service, but they're spending a lot of money there. Um, and this, uh, at Apple as well, these are not their core businesses. And so they are not, they don't have the same level of exposure or history to negotiating with unions. And I think we're feeling some of that in, in this negotiation as well. How far down do you think that goes? There are so many people on uh, on the YouTuber island here that don't seem to think that this matters for us. Or if it does, it only creates opportunities. Yeah. And so what I'm trying to get my head around is like, what are the easily missed consequences? Uh, because we can see that mm -hmm. the downstream consequences to us right now have a lot to do with um, – how creators get paid for AdSense or for you could go right now, maybe you even do pay for YouTube premium. It's like $10, $15 a month and you get to watch YouTube with no ads. Yeah, and whatever you watch, it. some of that money goes to whoever made the mm -hmm. video that you just watch. Similar to how Nebula works. The difference though is that the, the creators don't get into a room with YouTube to negotiate what that rate is. It's yep. based on air quotes, industry standards or yeah. what they deem fair. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. is a trickle down from what music streaming had to do. And music streaming famously underpays artists. Yeah. Uh, frustrating anecdote here. The thresholds you have to hit to monetize a video on YouTube are uh, 1,000 subscribers and some number of stream hours within the last year. If you are a, uh, an independent musician putting out a music video every so often, the amount of time and effort and energy it takes to create a music video, you're not putting one out every week. So your yeah. opportunity to build audience is very, very slow. So there's a really good chance, even if you're like going at it, there's a good chance that it's going to take you years potentially to build up to, to that level of, of, of numbers, which in theory would be fine. That's fair. Except YouTube gets to put ads on those uh, music videos as much as they want to between the first time you upload and when you do hit those numbers. And yeah. when you do, it's not like they were holding that money in escrow. They were making money on your work the entire time. And having talked to YouTube about this, the answer that I got was, well, we're giving you free hosting. Yeah. Yeah. So these are already consequences of the bullshit that the industry, that the media companies have pulled 
on you guys and on the music industry in the past. So what are the things about this that that can or or will likely affect you know the the general us? So I have, I have two answers there, and, and I'll, I'll say them aloud so I don't forget to get to the second one. I want to talk about transparency and free work. So first, let's talk about transparency, um, which is really how do we know how many times a thing has been shown? How do we know? You, you're giving us these numbers. How do we know if they're accurate? Yeah. And yeah. one of the things that the WJ has the ability to do, which we already have the ability to do, is to is to go into the books of Netflix and Apple and Amazon and see uh, how successful a show is, how many subscribers they actually have, um, and and know sort of what tier these things are falling into. Um, we're able to do that, I think, twice a year, and so we can go in there, and it's 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 a hassle, but we can do it. Um, what we'd love to be able to do is to do what we've always been able to do, which is, you know, you say like, okay, how many DVDs of, of Charlie's Angels did you sell? And that our, you know, John August gets three cents for every uh, DVD you sold of Charlie's Angels, and we figure out residuals. Um, we used to always be able to do that. That's called success-based residuals, and that like the more something the most successful the thing is, the more money the writer gets for it. Um, and now the streamers are saying, no, 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 we will never share that proprietary information. We're not going to tell you how many times a person has watched a thing. Um, and so part of this negotiation is like, how do we figure out meaningful success-based residuals? Does it have to be a penny for every time a show is streamed? No, but it should be some sort of, you know, some um, initial fixed amount and then tiers that go up as a thing becomes incredibly popular. The really popular things should be worth more. Um, so that's the thing we're fighting for in this negotiation. Um, and also just, you know, recognizing that what started as a very U.S.-centered business, uh, we were streaming English language shows to to people in the United States and Canada, is now a global phenomenon. And making sure that we are accurately capturing the value of these things we create all around the world. Because right now, we are paid a certain rate for subscribers inside the U.S. and a much, much, much lower rate for subscribers worldwide. That's where all the growth is going to be, and so we need to make sure that those things grow. I think a lot of your creators are going to nod and sort of feel similar things in terms of like YouTube is telling us this number, but it's a really good number. Dave Wiskus is telling us this video got a certain number of views. How do I know he's telling us the truth? How do I go in and audit? Well, mm-hmm. you as an individual uh, video creator, no way you're ever going to win that. But if uh, you know if you have the entire union behind you and you're able to sort of negotiate in your contract, you damn well will get in there and you'll have a whole arbitration thing where you can pursue judgments against places that are not, you know, uh, paying what they should be paying. So that's, again, the advantage of having a giant union behind you versus being one individual person. Yeah. YouTube does like you can go and you can see full analytics, but you know, how, how cooked are the books and who has the response, but like, yeah. we, it's not like we get to negotiate our contract with YouTube. No, like it, no. it's we we sign the the partner program deal and yeah and we're we're done. Uh, the yeah. other part you said was free work. So let's talk about free work. So this is a thing. So mostly we've been talking about episodic, so stuff on streaming. But I'm mostly a screenwriter, so I, the screenwriter issues are really big for me. And one of the big issues in for screenwriters has been free work. And so um, traditionally, if I'm hired to write a movie, if I was hired to write Aladdin. Um, I make a contract with the studio and they say, great, we will pay you X dollars for this draft. And then they will pay me half that money at the start and they'll pay me half the money when I deliver the script. And so if it was $100,000, they would pay me $50,000 at the start and $50,000 when I delivered the script. And there'd be a set writing period, so maybe eight or 12 weeks for me to do that work in. In theory, that's great. Uh, In theory, I I know that 12 weeks from now, I'll be made whole on my, my work and I'll be done or I will go on to another draft uh, in practice, what happens with me, but with sort of you know everyone who's ever written a screenplay for a, um, one of the studios, is they'll pay you that first check, and then when you try to deliver the script, they're like, "Oh, before you turn that in, could you do a little bit more work? A little more work? Oh, what it, could we make a few little tweaks before we give it to my boss? We really need to get this thing taken care of." And that time will drag out and out and out and out and out, and so suddenly this thing that should have taken you twelve weeks is taking you twenty weeks or a year. And they're basically holding that 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 last paycheck hostage. Um, so some of our proposals in this uh, draft or this contract negotiation are about getting writers paid weekly for those uh, scripts. And so instead of holding you out for that that last fifty percent at the end, no, they have to pay you out you know week by week as things go along. So then when it comes to 
you know, the time when you're training your script, you've already got 90% of your money. And suddenly you have a lot more leverage to say no to free work uh, and say like, okay, no, I'm actually, I'm officially handing this in, uh, you know, pay me my last check, but I'm done here. I bring this up because we talk about, you know, creators doing their, their work, but I think there's probably a lot of other people who are in this economy that you're describing who are in that free work trap where they are being asked to do, oh, could you do just a little bit more, a little bit more? They may have mm-hmm. negotiated like what they're going to be doing for stuff, but like they're doing a lot of free work for people and they have no ability to push back. And um, that's an inherent problem that we're trying to solve, you know, guild wide for screenwriters. But I'm sure there's artists and other you know, creators who are experiencing the exact same kind of stuff there because in order to maintain that relationship, in order to get paid that final amount they're, they're due, they're always trying to. They're always being asked to do a little bit more. Well, now I'm second guessing myself here because mm-hmm. the, the I was going to ask this as a question, so I'm just going to say how we do it for Nebula Originals, which are creator led productions. They are the showrunner on the thing. They get to make all the decisions. We have production facilities available to them, but they don't have to use them if they don't yeah. want to. We budget it out. Creator fee is included. Um, we cover budget as necessary, or we we you know. The things get paid for. The creator fee is half up front, half on delivery. Mm-hmm. What I'm hearing here is that there are opportunities, not that we are using that in bad faith or using that as a negotiation tactic or dragging things out for free work, but there is an opportunity in the system, however altruistic or benevolent I might be, someone else might be sitting in my chair one day, and perhaps oh, yeah. it is better for us to have a system that accounts for that. And so the model you're describing is also very true for books. And so when I, I have a series of books called Arlo Finch, and for those you're paid half up front and half on delivery. There's a whole pattern mm-hmm. for sort of how you're, you're paid out on those things. You know, I think it makes sense where you actually have entire, sorry, entire control over the thing that you're doing, and you, I, I can deliver the whole book as in sort of one chunk. Uh, where it doesn't work is when it's clear that you're going to get notes along in the process, and that that uh. the, that time and Time and, and payment is, are broken apart. It really gets back to what I was describing too, in terms of, you know, episodic and the, the short seasons and sort of the crisis of that. It's like the total amount of money you're being paid is a function of dollars and weeks or time. And if they're dragging you out for time and time and time, it doesn't matter how much that that number is. It's going to get pushed down lower and lower and lower. And so we, you know, in this negotiation, we surveyed all our members, and we found there were showrunners who were like running the show. Twenty five percent of them were working at minimum. And they didn't start out working at minimum. They were, they were being paid a higher salary, but because the show schedule was getting dragged out to be so long, amortized, it got them all the way down to being paid as much as a story editor was being paid, uh, which is crazy. And so these are problems that we have wow. to fix in this contract. How much of this is a function of collaborative creative work produced for a company that owns what you do versus mm-hmm. so much of, of like, internet content creator, YouTuber, podcaster, uh, the, the, the joy and the terror of it both mm-hmm. is independence. Yes. Like you own the things you make, like your, your podcast script notes, you yeah. own script notes, you get 100%. to decide what happens with it. And there's more risk, potentially more reward. Um, uh, but how much of what you're seeing in the, the, the negotiation or the, the, the friction there is simply a function of you don't own your work. The only reason we are we can be a union under U.S. labor law is we are employees, and we decided to classify ourselves as employees so that we could become a union because we saw that that was the way to um, to make this possible. If I didn't we were, know that was a thing, yeah, that's a thing. So uh, if we were if we were all if if we were not employed by the companies, but we're just like a partner with the company, or like we were sort of subcontracted, there's there's, there's under U.S. law. Unions can protect employees, but they cannot protect sort of companies. Mm. And so even though they may hire my loan on company, they're hiring the services of John August, who is a WGA member and therefore the, the employee. Right. So sort of fundamentally, YouTubers couldn't unionize unless we all signed employment contracts with YouTube. That ain't happening. There's probably some other uh, way to do it, but it wouldn't be under classic labor law because labor law protects, you know, is about the relationship between employees and management and to, between the, the corporations and the employees. It's, it's a way to sort of equal the, the, the playing field um, between like two really disparate power sources. Interesting. There's forms of collective action that are not organized labor. Um, mm-hmm. And so there may be some form of organization that YouTubers could ultimately do that could 
enabled them to do this. And honestly, what you're doing with Nebula is an example of collective organization because you're, you're choosing yeah. to, to group people together in, in ways that can remunerate them better than what they could get through a classic, you know, just going straight to YouTube. Like we have a partner manager, we have enterprise support, we have uh, executive level friends at YouTube. And yeah. because we we are legion, we get to go in and have a bigger conversation than any one of our creators could. So there's yeah. certainly an element of collective action, collective bargaining. We still don't get to negotiate those contracts, but like uh, we get to have bigger conversations, which is nice. But what concerns me, I have so much respect and so much empathy for what you guys are doing right now because there's a million ways in which I know this will affect us and there's a million ways in which I can feel this will affect us. But mm -hmm. also you get to do a thing that we can't do and you're doing a thing that we don't have to do, yeah. which which is collectively standing up and fighting for a thing on a stage where uh, the, there are consequences for for anyone who doesn't stand behind that, right? Like writers who cross the picket lines, et, yeah. et cetera. Um, we both don't get to do that and don't have to do that. Yeah. What terrifies me is the fact that we don't get to and, and we, we don't have to is that we miss out on all of the benefits. There's so much attitude of the algorithm owes me something. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's easy for me to get grumpy about that. And I certainly have on this show in the past. Uh, I get frustrated when creators feel entitled to success. Like this is a system that was created that is, has brought you all of your money and all of your attention. Show it some respect. On the other hand, uh, you do have to empathize with creators who build a business on YouTube and then suddenly the algorithm well dries up for reasons that they don't understand. Yeah. Because there was no writer's room that they were a part of. They didn't learn the ropes. This is an industry that is still being invented. There are mm -hmm. things we're all still learning together and it's so easy for somebody to uh, feel like they have – uh, some entitlement, uh, however loaded that word is, to to a degree of success, but not even having the ability to have a conversation with the platform about how the platform is changing is fundamentally a problem. We don't Agreed. know, as you say, transparency. We don't know when the algorithm is changing, why it's changing, or what the change is going to be. We're not told these things ahead of time. We're not told shorter videos are now going to be more important, everybody freak out. Or, yeah, we're really pushing shorts hard, but don't worry, we're gonna be feeding men. They'll give us like some bullshit hand wavy stuff, but we don't get to sit down and, and see how they're mapping it out. We just have to trust them. I should say that, you know, you talk about sort of the algorithm changing on a person. Uh, we can't, the guild can't, protect any writer from like being employed or not being employed. Like people can like, uh, a writer may just like sort of, sort of fail out of the industry. They may not be sort of staffed on shows again. We sort of can't, we can't dictate the fate of any one writer. All we can do is, to, is try to dictate the fate of writers collectively and sort of like how things are going to go. And so the example of, you know, YouTube changing their algorithm is like, uh, the studio is deciding to move to these short short orders and streaming and mini rooms and they're breaking production away from from stuff. We can say like, okay, we didn't get to vote on the change that you made, but this is the change you made. You broke the system. Um, it is hurting our members, and here's how we're proposing to fix the, the, the system. We can't force you to make longer series, but if you're going to insist on these rooms, they need to be paid at a premium. If you're going to... Uh, employ us for a limited number of weeks, those weeks have to be higher. You know, we need to have enough writers on staff to actually make the shows that you're asking us to make. So we we could help change the system that they created, but we can't sort of force them to go back to an old way of doing stuff because time only moves forward. And YouTube shorts might be a good analogy here mm -hmm. where it's totally fair. I mean, you look at the popularity of TikTok and you look at yeah. how that's blowing up and it's it's perfectly reasonable for YouTube to want to go and capitalize on some of that audience attention. Totally fair. Uh, the fact that it took them so long to make it so that when you post videos, when you post shorts to YouTube, you'd get paid anything for them, that's kind of fucked up. Yeah. And it would have been really nice if somebody could have gone into the room and said, no, we're not going to do this until we work out a system for how we're going to be paid for these. We still don't get to decide. Uh, the the algorithm shifts attention to shorts in whatever way it does. And you know, it's, I'm not going to pretend to fully understand that system. But also, like, I'm not going to pretend to fully understand that system. We yeah. don't know. But it does affect how we get paid. Yeah. And so that's why, you know, I don't have to know how 
uh, how many units I, one of my movies shipped in Bulgaria um, because we have union accountants and lawyers who can go through and do audits of these things and, and, and show that I was actually being able, that I should have been paid more for a certain thing. Um, and that is the advantage of coming together as a system and be, to be able to sort of collectively organize to do these things. We can afford to be able to have incredibly talented staff who can push back against all these things. Um, that's, that's the advantage of you know, bigger groups. So the, the collective action thing is about, uh, mm -hmm. functionally speaking, you don't have to do the audit. There's a group of people, like your, your union dues or whatever goes into this pool and yeah. it pays these people to go in and do those audits for you. Yeah, so 1.5% 1, 1. Of, of all the money I earn as a writer goes to the Writers Guild. And for that, um, they supervise health and pension, they do all the auditing. They take care of their making sure residuals get paid to me properly and on time. Um, they are, you know, a, a essential sort of structural caretaking function. Um, and as I have to pay that one point five percent, but I also have to participate in the guild. And and if we go out on strike, I'm required to show up on the picket line, and I'm you know required to withhold my labor from these companies. Uh, so the guild doesn't ask a lot for from us for sort of what we get out of it. Um, but when we do have to do stuff, it's important that we do it. Background, I, I texted you a, a few nights ago as I was seeing these tweets and thinking about like, do, is there something I need to be thinking about here? Is there something like, I run a streaming video service. I don't want, I don't want to step in shit. This is, there's obviously connective tissue. We're all in the entertainment business in some form or another together. Uh, what do I, what can I do to show solidarity and what can I do to make sure that we are not accidentally the bad guys? Yeah. And, uh, I, I appreciate that you like text me back immediately. We, I, I got as much context in my head as I needed to, to sort of like start the framework, but I'm coming into this conversation as like, I'm a dummy. There's so much of what you guys do over there on that side of the, the, the industry that is opaque to me and to others like me. And it's so easy for us to, to assume that what you do is similar to what we do. And yeah. so a lot of this has been me. I want to understand the similarities, uh, similarities. I want to understand the differences and where it starts to connect for me is what are the things we can or should be thinking about? And this isn't just a question for, mm. for me with Nebula, but like, would we, are, are WGA writers allowed to go do YouTube stuff? Uh, are YouTubers allowed to do things with, like what are, what, are the, uh, what are the ground rules that we might not even be aware of here? Yeah, so we have what are called strike rules and strike rules are published rules. You can look them up at wjcontract2023.org uh, that sort of lists like the requirements on members, like what you can do and what you can't do. And so those basically like you cannot work for any of the struck companies. You cannot set foot on their premises. Um, and, you know, we sort of go further to say like you should not be sort of doing anything with or for the studios. So don't put stuff that's in their pipeline. And so if our members are going to make, you know, short films, like I shot a, a, a short film called The Remnants at the end of the last strike. Uh, we had like Joss Whedon's uh, sing along horrible blog. Mm. Um, those kinds of things happen that were sort of YouTube -y, uh, hits. Uh, those are okay because they're not for this for this, the companies we're striking against. They're just things that are out there, and that there's no intention of of going through and doing other stuff. But it's important that your creators understand that part of the strike rule is they say like if you if you are working on behalf of these companies, if you're doing writing services for these companies on, on behalf. If you're doing if you're sort of scaving, if you're doing work that is would otherwise be a WJ writer. Uh, we're going to notice that and you're never going to get to join the guild. You're going to be barred from ever joining the guild. And so I think your creators need to be mindful that they're not uh, doing work for these companies, you know who they are, the, the big companies. Right. Um, that is the same work that we would have normally been doing, that you're not trying to sort of don't package together your, you know, your YouTube show <laughs> and then try to sell it to, to Netflix. Uh, that would not be looked upon well. Interesting. I wouldn't have thought of it that way. I wouldn't have thought that that would be the issue. So even going in, like taking, um, uh, uh, let's say the collected, uh, well, we'll go with, with with one of our more popular shows, Jetlag. It is sure. not a scripted show. It's it's a like a reality style uh, travel game show. For us to go and sell that to Netflix, if we were to go in, if, or if, uh, Sam, the creator behind the show, were to go in and try to sell that to Netflix, that's a problem. 
I would uh, because that is not a scripted show. I think that there's gonna be fewer issues. I think that there could be some side eyes given. Um, but it's if you're doing a show that is like uh, the other kind of shows, then I think there'd be more of a problem. So let's say you had a equivalent of like high maintenance uh, that you were doing for uh, YouTube and the, or Vimeo, and then you were going to take that to HBO. Doing that in the midst of a, of a ongoing strike, I think, would not be looked upon kindly. Right. Um, right. So, so I, I'm talking more of the kinds of stuff that we do is is the issue. So, uh, like uh, Raka Raka making the the, the, I forget the name of the movie they did. They sold to A24. Mm-hmm. Like that was a horror movie, I think. It's coming out ne- this year, next year. Uh, trying to do that deal, taking that movie to A24 now, potentially very, very problematic. Or, yeah, and uh, again, I think I said this earlier in the conversation, is like, are you feeding the pipeline? Are you making it easier for these companies to uh, to keep on going uh, during the strike? That's not an awesome look uh, <laughs> at this moment. Uh, so what about and again, forgive me, I'm coming at, yeah. at this from a place of I'm I'm a dummy and I'm acting as a proxy for all of the other dummies who are wondering how to navigate this. Uh, I, I had a conversation with a creator, not one of ours, but a, a friend a couple days ago who is uh, working on he's he wants to make a movie mm-hmm. and his goal is to he he's working with a writer friend. Um, they're going to write the thing and then they're going to go out and sell it. Hint, without having a studio attached and God knows how long it'll take them to write it, is the process of writing it now problematic? The process of writing a spec material now, which is basically something that you control completely yourself, you're not trying to shop at some place, you're not you know, uh, attaching you know, talent to it, that's the thing that is going to happen and that, that, mm. that, that's not going to be a major issue. It's when you are taking that script and turning around and sending it in through... Uh, into Disney or into any other place that it's getting it closer to production, that's the issue. So okay. um, the Writers Guild is never going to come and say like, no, no, you, you know, you cannot write <laughs> your own thing on your own time. Uh, but uh, so I, I wouldn't be worried about that. That said, I think most screenwriters I know, they're working on other stuff during this, this time off. For us, we're working on the Script Notes book, uh, which we're very late in delivering. And so we have a deal with Crown Publishers for that. And so we are going to be, you know, however long the strike is, will be the number of weeks that we get to uh, really buckle down and get those chapters delivered for the script notes book. So books are okay. Uh, video game writing, okay? You know, there are some video games that are covered under WGA contract. It's a different contract. Um, video game writing is very much like what we do. Those writers really deserve the same protections. All, all folks working in video games really deserve collective um, representation. Uh, at this point, I'm not aware of any problems with video game stuff, but I'm not okay. the expert there. Okay. The last time it was 100 days. Mm-hmm. What What is the optimism level currently? I think we don't know how long this is going to be. And so uh, we know in a very short period of time that the DGA is going to go into start negotiating their contract tomorrow. So the Director's Guild uh, will go in and, and talk with the same people that we were talking with for the last six weeks. Um, and they will try to get to terms on their deal. They owe you some favors on that one. They're going in at uh, the exact right time. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the DGA will, you know, there's some issues that overlap between the two of us. Obviously, um, they're going to care about minimums for their members, and so dealing with inflation, so they'll push some stuff up a little higher there. They care about overseas residuals, just like we do. So there can be some things that are areas of, of mutual interest. But they also have a lot of their own special things that are just unique to their union. They need more health and help with uh, pensions and health care. Um, they want to make sure that their directors get hired in overseas productions. There's lots of stuff that's specific to them. So whatever deal they make there, um, some of that will pattern back to us when we finally get back into the room with them. Um, the actors go in after DGA. So I would say, in general, it's unlikely that we'll have a deal um, before the actors finish their deal. But you never know. This has been a really surprising negotiation. Very public. As much as the last one mm-hmm. was, 2007. Yeah. Um, this time around, I think that COVID is an interesting uh, conflating factor where for a, a good chunk of recent human history, we became very dependent uh, psychologically, emotionally, on being able to binge watch lots of prestige content. Uh, and then there was that gap where we knew – that new stuff wasn't being made. Yeah. And so like there's a, no, no, we need this and now you're turning it off. Shit, you can't produce things. So like there's a almost a a more visceral reaction um, 
from people who were content fans uh, yeah. now than in the age of like I think the one of the the bigger casualties last round was like you know season two of Heroes wasn't as good. Yeah, thinking back to COVID, I mean, I would just say like the the area of the writers guild we haven't talked about is comedy variety. So in addition to episodic and features, we also represent all the writers who are working for your favorite late night shows. And mm-hmm. so um, during COVID, the late night shows obviously went dark, but then they came back up again with like Seth Meyers in his attic, and like we were able to yeah, sort of get yeah. back to some sense of normalcy because we had those shows. You're not going to get those shows until there's a WJ deal, and so those shows are going to be dark for the foreseeable future. Um, and that's going to feel weird and different. I mean, we're not used to those, you know, those shows being reruns, but there'll be nothing but reruns in that spot for a long time. Last time, right, you'd mentioned uh, Joss Whedon, uh, Dr. Mm-hmm. Horrible Sing Along Blog. Yeah. That was when the internet was like just like streaming video was just, I think Hulu existed maybe at the time, but that was about yeah. it. This time around, what COVID taught us is I remember Seth Meyers in his attic complaining about how hard it is to be a YouTuber. And he's like got a bird outside yeah. his window and he's like, he has to watch t- makeup tutorials and people are making fun of him in his comments because his makeup isn't done right and the lighting is yeah. bad. And he's like, I know it's really hard. And then we had uh, what, like Jack Black, Will Smith, Brie Larson all going out and starting YouTube channels during mm-hmm. during that yeah. that era. Uh, how likely is it that we see these people who are, you know, the actors in particular, used to getting a certain level of attention, they like to go out and get that mm-hmm. attention. And when COVID happened, they found other ways to do it. They went to the internet. What are the the rules? I suspect that there are actually some guardrails around uh, some of these people who would normally have shows going to do a YouTube show. In the meantime, they, there may be like contractual reasons why they're not allowed to do that. We'll see. I mean, We've had great solidarity between all of those late night hosts, um, which I think has been mm-hmm. really helpful. Like you know, to agree they're competing against each other, they're also so they recognize they're all in the same boat. Um, so you could see that stuff. It's yeah, we're one week in, so who knows yeah. uh, what could happen down the road? Well, with writers, directors, actors in that order mm-hmm. going to the table, if this drags out, how long before those people just like start getting together and making things that they sure. own on Vimeo or on? Uh, get the comedy people doing stuff on Dropout. Get the nerds to come do stuff with us and uh, build your yeah. own platforms. Like how, yeah. what could the fallout look like? I mean, I think, you know, the internet was so new and YouTube was so new um, that doing those sort of things that were meant to be web first felt really new and exciting back in 2007. Uh, we're obviously not at that point right now. So we'll see what the interesting opportunities are. Well, as you noted earlier, the barrier to entry uh, is very low. It's very low. And the risk is much lower. So when you've got a bunch of talented people who can't work within the studio system anymore and they want to go do things with that talent, they want to mm-hmm. feel creatively fulfilled and they want to be, I don't know, making things to fill out their portfolio for when things get turned back on and they can go back to work in the traditional sen- uh, sense of the word. Uh, maybe they turn to making mm-hmm. things more in our arena and using that as a, as a, I don't know, a way to keep sharpening their blades, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, we'll see what happens. And it's it's really hard to say what's going to make sense. Uh, you know, these are talented people who can do lots of cool things. And so I wouldn't be surprised to be surprised. Through all of this, not only would we hope that you guys all get a better deal, but that um, in an era, this is why I think it's so dumb for them to, to push back so hard on this stuff is because the alternatives to... Um, let, let's say in the the 80s and early 90s, the alternatives to the radio and um, mm-hmm. a, a big music label structures were go fuck yourself. Yeah. You'll just never be a rock star. And in the era of anyone can put songs on Spotify and Apple Music and all the other things, and the number one music streaming service, YouTube, uh, when artists have access to infinite distribution – then the dynamic, the power balance changes. So to create an environment where like, okay, you can't make stuff for the studio system anymore. uh, Some of those people are going to go and build things outside of the studio system, which one of the long-term implications could be, not saying will be, but could be uh, a more rigorous and impactful disruption of that system, which personally I would hope for. But like, it's weird that they're not thinking about that. One of the the challenges that we've been facing, and again, it's a structural thing that we're not able to, address as a union is the vertical integration of these companies. And so um, back mm-hmm. in the 80s, 
you had Carsey Warner, which was the production company behind, I think, the Cosby Show and a lot of other you know sort of sitcoms. Um, so you worked for them, and then they sold the show to the network, and the the, the network and the studio could not be the same company. And then right. the laws changed; they could become the same company, and and one could buy the other. And so now we're writing things directly for Netflix, and there's no other uh, company in along the way. And if you try to sort of like, okay, I'm going to gather together a bunch of money and we're going to do our, our shows ourselves and then sell them to the companies, they'll say, oh, that's lovely that you think you're going to do that. Uh, we want 50% ownership of this thing. Basically, in order for, in exchange for distributing your show, we have to own it as well. Um, and that's sort of a crisis. Nothing the guild is going to be able to fix, but it feels like a capitalism problem that the government <laughs> would have to step in at some point to fix. Yeah, we're seeing a bit of that on our side too. There are companies mm. that I would love to name but won't who are doing things now where they're either trying to buy YouTube channels or they're trying to like do, uh, what do they call it, syndication deals where yeah. they'll take all of your YouTube videos and put them up on Facebook and then give you half the money. And they'll give you a bunch of money up front which sounds really good. And then half them, I wasn't, I wasn't even putting my stuff on Facebook. And now they own your distribution rights. And yep. one of these companies, their contract uh, is that after three years, when the contract is up, you can either renew the contract or you can terminate it. But if you terminate it, you have to give them back all of the money. Oh, yeah. No, that's a fair deal. Yeah, that sounds great, right? Like who, who would push back on that? Uh, or the the companies who uh, they own your AdSense for some period of time. Like all of these basically like payday loans where mm -hmm. you're giving up all of your rights, possibly in perpetuity, uh, in exchange for a little bit of cash up front. It's basically that that same kind of thing where the idea of distribution, even though you can, on the internet, you can distribute mm -hmm. your shit wherever you want to, but these companies will come in and talk a big game about how much you'll get. And it might even be true. It might even be true that they can get you in front of more things or get more viewers or bring in more revenue, but what do you lose along the way? And then what do we collectively lose along the way when you know, one or two big companies own the entirety of the relationship with those external distribution platforms? Yeah. What happens when the only way you can get your YouTube videos put onto Facebook is through this opaque system that is clearly predatory? And yeah. it is it is the case. That is actually true right now. It's, it's very hard to monetize on Facebook because like their thresholds are so high. But these companies have deals with Facebook where they can instantly get the stuff monetized. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no shortage of, of horrifying stories for screen writers and TV writers who've encountered like bad systems and bad producers and bad companies and, and, and really shitty behavior. And I think one of the the lucky upsides of having a guild is that like the guild can at least set the floor, and so that the, the guild can come in and fight for you on certain things. They can get you out of certain situations, because if those companies don't abide by those rules, we can boot them out, and they're no longer guild signatory, and they could get none of our writers. And so that's the kind of power that a guild has: is that like, um, as members, we can only work for the companies that have signed onto uh, this contract, and that that helps. So, if, for example, if, if one of the companies is refusing to pay residuals to its writers. The guild can say, "Okay, uh, if you're not going to pay, none of our none of our writers can work for you anymore." And they will send notices to all those writers, like, "You think you're writing for this company? You cannot. They're basically they're they're blacklisted, and uh, that's a way to withhold stuff from them." So, what? Uh, how does that work in a case where I'll use us as an example? Yeah. Um, we have no relationship with the WGA. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're not on, as far as I'm aware, any list anywhere. Yeah. Uh, so if somebody wants to come write something, let, let's assume there's no strike. Yeah. Uh, like we, we are not party to that contract. If somebody wants to come write a thing for us, what do we do? How do we? So if, if you were going to try to do stuff that was ultimately going to be intended for, uh, one of the streamers, one of the broadcast networks, uh, you would have to become a guild signatory. There's a process you'd have to go through and you have to, to sign up to do that in order to, to employ a guild writer. Um, it's not onerous to do, but you have to be able to prove that you are a legitimate company and that you're going to be able to fulfill these obligations down the road. Fundamentally, my question here is uh, beyond like how should we be thinking about this? And I'll get to that uh, sort of as a final thought in a second. But how how can we be sure both literally me and, and Nebula and our creators, but more broadly, this this industry of YouTubers, uh, what are the things we can do to make sure that we're good citizens here? Because this is a much more complicated, uh, the, the, the sheer number of things I've learned on uh, over the course of this, this recording are, are uh, my, my brain is spinning. What are the yeah. things that we can do to make sure that we're, we're playing fair and, and you know, 
good participants? I would say, think of yourself as a WJ writer. So think of yourself, if you were in the guild, uh, what are ways that you would be uh, contributing to the writers getting a good contract or standing in the way of the writers getting that good contract? And so uh, make decisions that would probably help get the situation resolved by uh, increasing the writer's guild power to negotiate a fair contract with the studios. So that means like not doing work that is analogous to um, the work that writers would be doing, especially for these struck companies, not putting things into the pipeline uh, yeah. that is going to make it easier for these companies to withstand the strike. Um, the other sort of good citizenship thing to do is like, I know people keep reaching out like, well, what, how could I individually help on this? If you're in Los Angeles or New York and you want to join a picket line, you just walk right up and sign on a little clipboard, pick up a sign, and you're on the picket line. It's like it's that easy. So if you go to wjcontract.2023.org, you'll see a list of all the picketing locations. You, you show up. Um, there's a could be a person there who's the picket coordinator at that place. Uh, they'll probably have some sort of vest on. They'll be maybe standing under some sort of tent, and you know, you'll sign on a clipboard. You'll pick up a sign, and you'll be marching and chanting with uh, the writers who are on strike there. Bodies help. Um, that's how we've gotten so many productions shut down this last week is by picketing in front of where they're supposed to be shooting. And uh, suddenly they can't be shooting there anymore because uh, either it's too noisy, but more likely because Teamsters are on our side and Teamsters are not going to cross a picket line. So those trucks won't get through or other crew will say like, you know, I'm not going to cross that picket line. Actors will say, I'm not going to cross that picket line. And so 10 shows shut down this week that would otherwise be in production. Um, so picketing is a way to sh- like physically show support. You know, I think the coming through the uh, issues with Black Lives Matter, I think there's a whole generation who's like so much more comfortable being out there protesting. Uh, this is the same kind of protesting. It's just more organized and uh, has a few more rules on it in terms of, you know, don't block the sidewalks. But other than that, you <laughs> can sort of uh, use your body to sort of make, your, make your, your, your point. The other thing that I hadn't thought of is even if you are not involved, picking up a sign helps. I didn't yeah. know that. I, like, I, I don't know if I qualified to get out and pick it. That's interesting. Yeah, you, you, Dave was because you are qualified to get out and pick it and show your support. And so, uh, in Los Angeles, you know, I would say like this. I sort of said it the first week, um, like give us give us a few days to sort of get stuff sorted out because like there's a whole system to get in place. But like that system is now in place, and so we have 15 picketing locations across uh, Los Angeles, and they're all run by really great volunteers and staff. Uh, and so we're out there. Nine to five every day, you know, picketing and sort of, you know, outside the studio gates and making sure that it is uncomfortable for them to be uh, crossing those picket lines uh, if they choose to do so. Um, so yeah, it's, it's it's very doable, and we have more and more, I would say, actors and directors and other just people who are interested in the, the industry. Um, people who sometimes call pre WGA, like these are writers who are not yet WGA, but like they aspire to be there. They're coming out there and they're. It's like a networking opportunity, or is that like a solid you know, thing? It is, and so I think it's a chance to uh, to chat with people who are making your favorite movies and TV shows, um, and just sort of be a part of an action for an industry that you hope to be participating in. Because, like, really, whatever gains we make in this cycle, they'll have some impact on us, but they'll have the biggest impact on writers 10, 20, 30 years down the road. Because we are all coasting off of what strikes did, you know, twenty or thirty years ago. I mean, 50% of our members are working on streaming projects. Um, streaming is only covered because of the 2007 strike. So, you know, we're talking sort of decades long impacts mm. of these kind of actions. Yeah, I think the the answer to my question really of like, how does this mm. impact YouTube? How does this impact YouTuber? May well be that. It may well be that uh, people who are, by and large, people who are making things, making YouTube videos for a living, a statistically significant portion of those people aspire to do things in traditional media. Yeah. And if you want to be there, then being a force for good is a much smarter play for you right now. Even if you don't think it'll affect YouTube, if you imagine that your career ever yeah. goes beyond what you're doing today, and if you st- if you think you're still a YouTuber in 15 years, you better fucking rethink how you're playing this game. Uh, if you do want to, to, to move into other parts of, of entertainment, then being a good citizen today, good, but also like thinking through to your own future, good. No, I, I you know we've seen uh, you know YouTubers out on the picket lines. We've also seen Twitch streamers out on the picket lines. Uh, do it, great. Uh, you know, come on out and sort of participate in it because 
you will have you know reach and exposure to your base that you know may not know anything about what's happening here, uh, particularly internationally, who don't have a sense of sort of what it is that's happening in, in the United States. So go for it. I mean, if, if Mr. Beast wants to do something, we're up for it. Um, share that message. <laughs> I'll pass that on. If you thinking about the similarities and the differences, if you were to suggest something, if you were to give a piece of advice, uh, not just about the strike, but about um, you've been in this game for a minute, and yeah. you you've sir, you've uh, filled different roles within the WGA. Yeah, uh, you've worn different hats. You've got some you know some scar tissue. You've been to battle. Mm -hmm. uh, when you think about the collective action and you look at our world where that's not, it, you can't do it in quite the same way, what advice would you give to YouTubers in thinking about how they might ensure that they don't get taken advantage of? There's self-advocacy, which is basically standing up for sort of what it is you need, what it is you believe, and then there's sort of group advocacy. And I think finding that balance is really important. You're always going to be looking for like, what is it that I can do that I can say that will sort of get me what I need to sort of make the, the, the video I need to make, to make the, the art that I need to make. Um, but there's also the stepping back and looking at like, people like me, what do people like me need? Or what, what stories am I, I'm not actually aware of? Because um, we're talking about sort of organized labor within the entertainment community, but of course there's organized labor throughout the United States and throughout the world. Um, and recognizing that it's all part of the same story. And maybe just take a moment to recognize that the fact that you're able to have some of the protections you have, the fact that there is the concept of a weekend, all came out of organized labor. And uh, just be kind of grateful for that and be thinking about sort of what are choices you can make now that will make things your life better, but will also make life better for people who are trying to do the same kind of stuff five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road. You know, I first started my website, johnaugust.com, um, to answer questions about screenwriting because uh, I entered this industry. I had just no idea how some stuff worked. I had all these questions and I would I'd look on the internet and there would just be wrong answers to things. And it's like, you know what? I know the answer to this. I'm just going to like put out the right answer for this thing and just put it on my website. We started Script Notes, the podcast, because there was just a bunch of charlatans who were giving screenwriting advice and sort of talking about screenwriting who really knew nothing about it and were just kind of just vamping. Uh, so Craig and I, every week, sort of, answer questions about screenwriting and talk about what it's like, really like to do this job. So I would say if you're a creator who's out there um, working on your own stuff, be thinking about how you can sort of give back and contribute what you know to the community around you and make, you know, leave this campsite better than how it was when you showed up. I'm realizing now that one of the big takeaways for me in this conversation is the realization that there's um, something inherently exploitative in the 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 relationship that we have with the platforms right now mm -hmm. where uh we have the hustle culture thing oh, like yeah. rise and grind uh keep cranking out videos find your audience and there's no shortage of people in this industry who want to tell you how to get more views or how to do yeah. any of these things and we all believe that it's the it's the american dream right we're all just temporarily displaced millionaires like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just a super successful YouTuber who hasn't been found by the algorithm yet. And if I keep on doing it, I'll get there. And along the way, uh, the, the notion that we have to get up and you know, rise and grind, keep putting things out, work all day, every day until you get there. Uh, it takes a lot of the responsibility off of the platform to make sure that there are any protections for our physical or mental health. We are all yeah. just independent, Right. We are all independent creators of things, and that is a dream job, and that is amazing, and you can get super rich. But the truth is that there's a huge collection of people out there making stuff on YouTube, making things that you probably watch, who are living AdSense paycheck to AdSense paycheck. Oh, yeah. And there is no system to, to help protect them outside of, you know, just grind harder. You're just not smarter. You don't want it badly enough. Yeah. So, I mean, WJ writers – Every one of them is comes out of that hustle culture to some degree too. Like you're, it's it's all entrepreneurial. You're writing your stuff. You're you're getting it out there. You're trying to convince somebody to hire you to do this job, either on a, uh, a comedy variety show or as a screenwriter or as a member of a writing staff or to sell your show to a network. Mm -hmm. It is all that, and so it's all so familiar. I'm sure to all the content creators who are watching this. Um, but we also have a 
the protection of a union. Mm -hmm. So we have to do all that grinding, but we also have some protection against abuses. Um, yeah. So we have protections about how little they can pay us, about demands for free work. We have protections on um, we have health, we have pension plans, um, we have the ability to like you know take time off after you've had a kid, uh, which is amazing. And so yeah, some of these are pr protections probably should come from the government. It shouldn't just be uh, you know, falling on a union to do it for you. But we got them, and uh, and just it, it, we are remarkably grateful to the people who had to fight and strike before us to get us those, get us those protections. There's so much here, and we it, it's uh, I, I had a sense of this, and I tweeted mm -hmm. a couple of days ago. Uh, the the picket line is the front line. As yeah. as as goes your contracts, so goes the industry, the entire industry to some degree or another. And we should all be mindful of that, and we should be good citizens. Uh, I just have so much respect for what you guys cool. are doing, what you're fighting for, um, the way you're going about it. Uh, you know, the last time we saw something like this was 2007, and it's a very different world now, and yeah. more people are making things that vaguely appear to be the shape of, of TV and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, as we cast ourselves into that role, it is easier to, I hope, empathize with your position. At least it is certainly for me personally to look at what you guys are doing, and I can say, I, I can understand what it might be like to be there, to be yeah. fighting for this, uh, because it truly matters. And this is... Uh, I, I just have so much respect for this because it can't be easy. It can't yeah. be easy to to set down a paycheck or a potential paycheck uh, and give up that short term security. And this is in, inherent to to um, collective bargaining, I suppose. Uh, but seeing it in action for things of this scale, um, stopping production on a popular show, stepping away from a big uh, paycheck, even if you uh, if if you might be having your moment. Uh, to be able to step away from that and get out in the picket line and fight for the people who haven't had their moment yet or who are being taken advantage of on their way to their moment. Uh, it means a lot. It's really cool to see. I'm sorry that you guys have to do this, but... Yeah, I had a conversation with a showrunner over the weekend who uh, had written a show that was had started production a couple weeks in, and so last Monday he had to step aside from the production. And I think he assumed, like, okay, well, the production will shut down without him, but the production just kept going. And so he had to, like... He had to step away, like knowing that this entire crew that he'd hired, all the scripts he'd written, these actors he'd cast, were just now going on and doing a thing without him, and were wow. going to editing without him. And uh, it's a tough thing for a union to ask for that member to say, like that showrunner to say, like, no, you, you cannot be involved in any capacity. Uh, but all these showrunners recognize the only way we're going to change these fundamental systems is to step away and, and just not participate in them until we uh, get through this uh, this period and find a contract that works. We have the things we have today because people who came before us exactly. were willing to make sacrifices to fight for this. They were able to make, you know, seasons of, you know, of their TV shows that were not as good as they could have been. You have Sean Ryan like not being around for his, the finale of his show The Shield, and that's just that's going to happen. Those are the, the the things that, you know, happen when you need to step away. Well, uh, uh thank you for what Sorry. you guys are doing and thank you for for coming in and talking about this. This is such an opaque system that we we have some visibility to the outside of it, but getting yeah. uh this much um inside candor I, I, it it means a lot and uh hopefully the people who are hearing this are starting to think about this stuff differently. Uh we can start helping take some action for the folks who uh aren't in New York or LA to go out and and join the picket line. Uh what else could we be doing? Well, something that you actually tweeted out, which I think is the, the, the right choice for a lot of people, is if you want to support uh, the industry during this time, because people are going to be out of work, uh, the writers are good. We have a $20 million pension fund. Uh, sorry, we have a $20 million strike fund that will sort of take care of our writers during this time. And uh, it's going to be, it'll be tough, but we'll get through this. But we're also really concerned about all the other folks working in this industry. So crew and actors and staff who don't have that that fund, and so there's a second fund set up, the Entertainment Community Foundation, uh, which is just for the non-writers to make sure that if production really stops the way it looks like it's going to stop, that you know mortgages get paid, that people are able to keep up on their health insurance and things like that. So uh, it's at the Entertainment Community uh, Entertainment Community Fund. You can put a link in the show notes to it, but uh, uh, and then you choose the film and television sort of on the drop down for that. And that is money that's going to go directly to cast, crew, and staff to make sure that they're taken care of uh, during this period. And just you know, 
you can be grateful for all the sh- you know, TV shows and movies that you've been able to watch uh, thanks to all these hardworking people. We made our donation a couple days ago. I would encourage anyone listening, uh, if you like TV or movies and you want the people who make these things to get paid for the things mm-hmm. that you enjoy, um, you know, anything helps. And uh, I think especially for creators showing solidarity to other creators, it's a good look and it's the right thing to do. And uh, it's great. it's whether you realize it or not, it's a protection of of all of our futures. Yeah. Uh, not to end it with a plug, but uh, where could people find you? Um, so I have a weekly podcast called Script Notes. Just look for Script Notes where that podcast with the orange logo on it. I'm um, johnaugus.com uh, is my website. I'm kind of on Twitter sometimes. At least I, I retweet a lot of WJ stuff on Twitter. <laughs> uh, just at John August. Uh, Instagram is at John August. I have not gone to Blue Sky yet. Maybe at some point I'll go to Blue Sky, but uh, uh, right now I'm just sticking to the, uh, the Twitter and the Instagram. I have a Mastodon that I'm occasionally posting on. So, yeah. <laughs> I feel like at some point uh, we should do another one of these uh, about uh, broader stuff because, like, the and, and here's a teaser for the audience for for what that might look like. Yeah, you and I met at a software conference because you make a screenwriting app. I have a whole separate company. Yes, you've and you've done like the uh, the writer's emergency pack, the the card game. Like you've done so much different shit. Yeah. like you. The reason that I I thought of you for for talking about this one, uh, uh, I know you, so it was uh, easy to get a hold of you. Uh, but two, like you bridged the gap between that world and this world. Like you have a podcast. There are probably people in my audience who know what script notes is, but didn't maybe know everything else that you had going on. Yeah. And so for somebody yeah. to have their that many hands and that many pies, like you're a you're a creator in the truest sense of the world. Yeah, I, I have I have deep knowledge of like the Apple uh, ecosystem and sort of how, how as a developer stuff works. So we make a weekend read, which is uh, an app for reading scripts on your phone. We have Highland, which is the number two or number three screenwriting software out there. Uh, we, we do a lot of different stuff in this company. And Fountain, the Fountain, uh, yeah, the markup language, yeah, yeah, the markup language. The, there's there's so much that you have going on. Um, mm-hmm. So at some point, let's uh, let's have a conversation about all that when uh, the other things have settled down a little bit. Yeah, well, when the strike's over, which will be soon, maybe. Who knows? Uh, it Here's could be a while. 